I'm going to spend time in Matthew uh, 13 addressing issues of wheat and tares. And we know that the wheat is the children of the kingdom and the tares are the children of the wicked one. And uh, you know in the English language you can make phonetic associations with words which really don't, don't really have, have a relationship, you know. Uh, many words are like that in the uh, English la- language. Bear, B-A-R-E, bear, B-E-A-R. You know, I, c- I couldn't, the meanings are, are different. B-E-A-R is an animal, and, and then to, to bear yourself is to expose yourself. There's no relationship necessarily between the two words, except their phonetic similarities. So you have tear, T-A-R-E, and you have tear, T-E-A-R. There's, there's no relationship between those words. A tear is simply a, uh, something that grows up that looks like a wheat, probably talks like wheat, and maybe acts like wheat. You maybe think it is wheat, but it's counterfeit because there's no fruit. There's no fruit. And uh, so in Matthew 13, there's the parable of the wheat and the tares, and there's also the parable of the sower, and there's some relationship between those two things that I'm going to make on certain points. Uh, for instance, in the parable of the sower, uh, I, I'm going to use I'm going to use the uh, the parable of the sower, the version that's in uh, Luke instead of in Matthew, because in the parable of the sower, in the uh, the version in, in in the book of Luke, chapter eight, it says, "But these bring forth no fruit to perfection." So when talking about the wheat and the tares, the wheat have fruit, the tares do not have fruit. They look up, they appear the same outwardly. Of course, we know he is not a Jew that is a Jew outwardly. Neither, neither is circumcision, the circumcision of the flesh, but he is a Jew that is one inwardly. And we're talking about a circumcised heart, right? It's a circumcision of the heart. And of course, there's a follow-through. First clean the inside of the platter. First clean the inside. First get the heart right so that Whatever comes out of the heart will also be manifested in the flesh. You will bring forth fruit unto righteousness. That is fruit. That is righteous actions, righteous deeds, righteous speech, righteous lifestyle. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. He that is born of God cannot sin. Why? Because there's seed There is a seed in the heart, and the seed has remained. That seed, the Word of God, has remained in the heart for a long enough period of time. It has been embraced with enough sufficiency that it has done a work. The the Word has remained, and a cleansing has taken place, a restoration has taken place in the heart, and the evidence, the fruit of that restoration of heart is the righteousness of the actions and the deeds. First the inward, then the outward. These bring forth no fruit to perfection. By their fruits we shall know them. We've been been through this before. We are trees of righteousness. A righteous tree brings forth righteous fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit. A corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. That means a corrupted heart cannot do righteous actions and deeds. It mm. cannot, because what's in the heart is going to spring forth out of the heart into the flesh and produce a result. The yeah. result that comes forth in the flesh is the fruit. Yeah. Like we said, you have an apple tree. What's the final result? The apple. You have a tree of righteousness. What's the final result? What you do in the f- express in your flesh. All right, now... Uh, so the uh, parable of the sower in, in Luke, I guess I'll start there. Sower went out to sow a seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. It was trodden down. The fowls of the air devoured it. Some fell upon a rock. As soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns. Thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. 
Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil, taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So here we're seeing clearly, the seed is the word of God, and the, the heart of a man is like the earth. So the seed is like, like the seed being planted in the earth, right? The seed falls on the earth, and the bird comes and takes it right away. That's mm -hmm. devil snatching the word, so that you, uh, the word does not remain. It does not remain to be considered. It does not remain to be uh, pondered upon. Let these sayings sink down into your ears, down into your heart. Keep these sayings. Embrace and meditate upon th this uh, quest for perfection, this call to perfection. Because in the parable of the sower, there's only one category that bring forth fruit to perfection. And the ministry is given for the perfection of the saints. And God said, be you perfect, even which, as your Father which in the, is heaven is perfect. So this is our mark, right? Amen. So you need to keep these things. And that's the seed that is, uh, that remains. And if that seed remains, and if purity and perfection and holiness of heart and soul and flesh is embraced, the fullness of perfection, if you keep it, if you keep it, eventually it comes to perfection. Eventually it comes to perfection. That's why he that sinneth continually sins, continues in his sin, never overcomes his sin. Now you can sin or you can sineth. You understand ETH is the continuation of sin. Everybody's going to sin. All have sinned. Everybody learns obedience by the things they suffer. All right? But we're talking about embracing, acknowledging perfection. So that's the rock. Some fell among thorns. The thorns sprang up and choked it. Okay. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then come the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They are on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. Okay? And that's uh, have root in yourselves. There's some, something where we have to be established. There has to be an established uh, confidence root uh, in a, uh, something where God establishes something between the individual. You have a, a root, an established confidence, root of faith, relationship between you and and the Holy Ghost, or you and Jesus Christ. The, the, the hairs of your head are all numbered. You have not chosen me, I have chosen you. I have called you by name. That individual uh, surety, that individual blessed assurance that you establish between yourself and Jesus Christ through your experiences and everything else. That's root in yourself. And you're going to need that to withstand... Um, the tests, the temptations, the, uh, the challenges, the, uh, the lies, the slanders. You know, Daniel was in the lion's den. The lion's den is like being in a, amongst a bunch of liars. People are going to challenge your integrity. They're going to challenge your uh, status with God. And you, you have to be able to be assured within yourself. You know, if I rely on being validated by everything from outside of me, then eventually I'm going to be in trouble. Because yeah. i got a lot of different conflicting witnesses of what people think of me. Some people think I'm a good guy. Others think I'm a jerk. And, you know, I, if I rely on someone else to supply me with a witness to keep me confident or keep me in, in a state of assurance, I'm, I'm going to be in trouble. Because I'm going to... That means I need the approval of man. I need approval from something from without. And the name of the game here, it's not a game, but, you know, it's just as a saying. The goal here is that you have root in yourself. The reason Jesus couldn't be tempted, and the reason the devil had no place in him, is because he knew who he was with God. He didn't need, I don't, I don't seek the honor from men. I don't need the honor from men. I have the honor that comes from God. Therefore, if I'm threatened with losing the honor of men, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't tempt me to try to be a man pleaser to get their honor back which would be leaving off the will of God. You know, if I please men, I'm not the servant of God. All right. So that's, you have to have root in yourself to be able to endure all of those challenges and tests and temptations. So then there's the, they that 
fall among thorns, and many of us are in and out of this status here. When they have heard, they go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to perfection. Cares, riches, pleasures of life. Last week I was emphasizing uh, sanctification. Remember? Diligence and sanctification. Uh, The altar sanctifies the gift. The practice and exercise and quest, the pursuit of sanctification is on us. We are to take the steps that that separate us from worldly activities, worldly cares, worldly pleasures, so that we don't occupy ourselves in them to the extent where it leaves no room to develop spiritually, right? So that is, uh, God's not going to do that. We do that. That's up to us. That's the opportunity that we show worship, where we willingly give up things. We willingly withdraw ourselves from Ways of living, lifestyles, actions, activities that do not profit. Oh yeah, all things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. Not everything's going to contribute or help you on this uh, journey to perfection, right? He that strives must strive lawfully, and everyone who runs the race, they all run, but only one gets the prize, right? So run to win, run to win eternal life, and when you run, you train, and when you train, You're temperate, you're deliberate, you're very moderate and temperate in what you do. You're very careful of what you allow to come into your, what you eat and and, and what you do. And you you set aside a lot of time for training and practice. Well, isn't that right? right. You set set aside a lot of time for prayer and looking into the scriptures and meditating on the things of God. And uh, you be very concerned about what you take in, your visual stimulus, you know what you're eating, if you will, not necessarily food, what you're eating, but the experiences that you're eating because it's going to affect the way you train. And if you want to become, uh, come to perfection and if you want to strive for the mastery and get the mastery, and that's what we're here, we're, we're, we're here to get the mastery. We're here to come to the fullness of stature. We're here to come to perfection. These bring forth no fruit to perfection. perfection. It's the perfection of the saints. And we can't, uh, and this will we do, if God permit. Let us therefore go on to? Well, we have to embrace that and go for it and be very deliberate about it. And that's draw nigh to God, He'll draw nigh to you. See, that's the part of the onus of salvation that's on us. Sanctify yourselves. Remember the beginning of the pattern of restoration I was talking about last week, Second Chronicles 29 and 30. 30, Hezekiah tells the Levites, Now sanctify yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers. Okay. So, um, now, that's the falling among thorns. They go forth, they're choked with cares and riches, pleasures of this life, bring no fruit to perfection. But they that are on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word of God, keep it. They keep it. Not only do they keep it in how they act, they first they keep it in their hearts. They keep the embrace of perfection. They don't make excuses. They don't make the mock at sin. They, they don't think it's a light thing what goes on in your flesh. They keep it. They keep the seriousness, the sobriety, the fear of God, the requirement that Amen. somehow we got to produce the righteousness of God in this flesh. Amen. And not only that, but when we produce the righteousness, it can't be our own righteousness. It has to be His righteousness. Wow. Now that's a tricky, that's a tricky outcome to uh, achieve. Now, this is a narrow way. It can't be too far to the left. can't be too far to the right. can't be too much law. can't be too much grace. A very narrow way. It's not your righteousness. It's His righteousness. And we've gone on and on and on talking about how that's achieved, generally speaking, in the operation of God. You go through afflictions and tests, trials, temptations. God brings you to your wits end. You cry unto the Lord. God teaches your heart that your sufficiency is from Him and not of yourself. You learn through failures that, that you can't do it by yourself. Therefore, you know your sufficiency and power to do it must come from God. Therefore, you will never claim your own glory for doing it and you will never be emboldened to depart from God throughout all eternity, that's part of the preparation of our hearts. That's an operation. 
But nevertheless, it's a narrow way, right? Be not over much righteous, be not over much wicked. You know how Ecclesiastes says that? Oh, it's by grace that we can do anything we want in the flesh. No, don't be over much wicked. No, that's over much wicked. That's excess of, of, of evil. Right? Oh, it's not a works of righteousness. God doesn't care what happens, what we do. It's only in the spirit, and it's only if you believe, and it's only in your heart. When, right? That's over much wicked. Don't be over much righteous. Be so self-righteous. Well, I keep the law, and I'm not like you. Oh, I don't do what you do. I'm holier than thou. No, don't be over much righteous either. There's somewhere there's a very narrow, right down the middle of those two things. But nevertheless, we're looking for righteousness and perfection. First in the heart, then in the flesh. And that, that's a preparation. That's something we, 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 we get in this life. We go for in this life. But these are they good ground, so they keep the word of God. Remember, he that is born of God cannot sin because the word, the, the, the seed, the word remains. It has remained in him. And, and has finally brought forth the righteousness of Christ coming forth out of the heart into the flesh. Right? Now Christ dwells in your hearts by faith, as Paul said. But this is a mystery like, like, like the baby is formed in the womb. So Christ comes into your heart by faith, and that's like, like a baby in the womb. But then the Christ has to be formed, just like a baby. You can make conception in a womb, but then there has to be the formation of a body within the womb, bringing it to a point where it is now sufficiently formed, where it can survive being brought forth and enter into the world. And so then it comes forth out of the womb, and then there's another development into maturity, right? Right? So you receive Christ in your hearts by faith. He forms into your heart. And then when he's enough of Christ and the word of God is comprehended and formed in your heart, then it can come out of your heart and it, can, it starts manifesting in your flesh. He can come forth into the world. See, born again. You see, born again. But then even then, it's Christ as a babe. Even that has to go through another maturing process and come to the fullness of stature and come to perfection. And that's how the pattern works. So, honest and a good heart, having kept the word, keep it, bring forth fruit with patience. It's going to take a, con you know, a, a continuing pursuit, effort. You have to keep this embrace. We have to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Always bringing these things to remembrance, even though we believe we know them, so that they have a preeminence, a a predominance and they affect our decisions more and more and more as we seek to sanctify ourselves unto this perfection. Now on the, on the issue that uh, God doesn't care about uh, the flesh and all of that, no man when he hath lighted a candle covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed. The righteousness of Christ isn't made to be just something that's within that nobody ever sees. Isn't that right? Right. <laughs> no, but you set it on the candlestick yeah. Yeah. so that everybody who comes in can see the light. Yeah. Everybody. everybody. Yeah, we, we put it forth on this fleshly candlestick. We bring it forth. We demonstrate. That which makes manifest is light. Yeah, that which makes manifest is light. But the... Uh, for we commend not ourselves as others, which need letters... But, but we... Uh, 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 by manifestation of the truth, by the manifestation of the truth, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. You understand? Mm -hmm. By having the truth manifested in our moral bodies, by living righteous and holy, by having moral, moral, a, a moral demonstration of life. Mm -hmm. Not by our own righteousness, by, by His righteousness. By having a moral demonstration of life, it commends ourselves to other men's conscience without us saying a word. We don't have to say a word because that righteous life, that's, that, that becomes a testimony of Jesus. It becomes a spirit of prophecy. And there is an emanating spirit from our life that affects not only the people we contact with, but the people who hear about us. Paul said, your, your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. You can have fact on people you don't even see. Through a spirit of prophecy, because of your righteous life. And so, the no man when he has lighted a candle covers it with a vessel. Who's the vessel? We're the vessel. No, no man with the righteousness of Christ leaves it covered over in the flesh not to be seen. 
It's seen. It's demonstrated. It's manifested. And by manifestation of the truth, that's what really commends ourselves to others. You know, not just the lip service. Oh, I just want you to know I serve God and I love the Lord. Well, I guess that's okay if, it's, if you're really speaking the truth. But what's more powerful than that is that manifestation of the truth, fruit to perfection. So, there is nothing secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Take heed, therefore, how you hear. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given. Whosoever hath not, from his, him shall be taken, even that which he seemeth to have. From there we go to the parable of the wheat and the tares. Remember that I use the Luke's, Luke's version of the, the parable of the sower to introduce the word perfection, because that's in there, but it's not in Matthew. But keep in mind now that the parable of the sower in, in Matthew 13 is right before the parable of the tares, wheat and the tares. Okay, okay, so the parable of the sower is telling you there's only the category number four, they that keep the word and, and bring forth fruit. And this, and then Luke says, fruit to perfection. Then right after that, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, and I'm in Matthew 13 now, verse 24, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence, hath, whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? He said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them into bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And then he expounds it. Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And again he said, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries unto the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. All right. So that's the end. That, that was, that was pertaining to the parable of the sower. The parable of the wheat and the tares. So we define the wheat and the tares, and most people know this is a pretty familiar portion of Scripture. And because we, we believe we're living in the end of the age, the end of the world, the harvest is the end of the world. Uh, let, let me read the, uh, the revelation of it. So, the, yeah, now skipping down to verse 36 in Matthew 13, Jesus sent the multitude away went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. That be any preacher that is anointed by the Holy Ghost speaking the word of God. That's the word of God. He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So on the grand scale, the parable is about uh, the plan of God over the course of time. The field is the world. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. So God is sending forth angels to gather tares into bundles to be burned. It's first the tares, then gather the wheat. And so we look at it, and we've been taught this before, that... Uh, you, you see the whole denominational Christian um, uh, organized structure of religion of man has come before the call to, to call the church out at the end of the age. First, the bundles, then gather my wheat out at the end. 
And that's what the Great Tribulation is going to do. The Tribulation and the Great Tribulation. It's going to press everybody out of false religious systems, false religious identities, false religious contexts, and we're going to be pressed and moved. To, and the, the only alternative for the true Christian will to be become a Christian. The only identity he'll be able to have is, is, a, is that he'll be a Christian, the Church of Jesus Christ. And I'll go talk about this a little bit again in terms of sanctification. Uh, just remember, uh, again, and I'll say it in Deuteronomy, don't eat your Passover in any place that you choose. You know, you hear calls on uh, ministries alike. Now, you know, you can hear good principles on radio, TV, and I've heard them myself, and I still listen to some of that stuff sometimes, but I won't identify with it, but I still can hear some good things. But nevertheless, you'll hear them say things like, now if you've said this prayer and given your life to Christ, go to the church of your choice. And that's not the call. <laughs> the call is that those are all tares come out of her, my people, Right? When you eat your Passover, you shall not eat it in the gates or in the place that you choose. You shall eat it in the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to put His name. And then Jesus again says, If any man comes in his own name, him you will receive, but you won't receive me because I've come in my Father's name. Now there's a simplicity and an exclusivity in this principle of sanctification and how you identify yourself as one that is a true worshiper of God, that you take unto yourself the name of Jesus Christ, and you don't add to it, and you don't take away from it. Therefore, if you're a Christian, you're not a Christian, you are not a member of the, of, of the church of Jesus Christ of the apostolic faith. You're not a member of the church of Jesus Christ by the apostolic faith, or of the Latter-day Saints. There's no additional thing that can make you distinctive from other Christians. You are a Christian. It is the church of Jesus Christ, and that's all there is to it. Anything above and beyond that is the potential and the inevitable development of another identity. It's as simple as that. And there's no name for a ministry. We have received the ministry of reconciliation. We've heard that before. It's a minister. So what I'm saying is, especially as we come to the end of the age, God is going to bring this simple principle of identity, the sanctification of the simplicity of the identity of the Christian being the name of Jesus and the name of Jesus Christ only. He is going to press us into that. He's going to press us in. You won't be able to be members of those other churches without falling into a world, new world order and, and the, the apostasy and compromise and the profaning of God's holiness. You won't be able to do it. Now, I know people stumble over this, but you hear it all the time. Okay, uh, me and Christopher were talking the other day, and it, it, uh, I, I kind of put some, some humor in it to make a point. You know, if, if somebody who is a natural Jew receives Jesus Christ, then sometimes they'll say, oh, he is a Messianic Jew. A Jew who believes that Jesus is Messiah, in other words. Oh, so, so here we have a group that's Messianic Jew. Well, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. You are dead. Your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, put to death, stop committing, stop yielding your members. Don't do these things anymore in your mortal bodies. These members, mortify them, put to death these members which are upon the earth. Stop doing these things. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which time you also walked in them. When you lived in them. But now also put off all these. Also the spiritual inward sins. Also. Which are anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not to one another. Lie not. Stop telling lies on your brothers and your sisters. Stop. Stop. Stop the slander. Stop the pointing of the finger. The accusation against the integrity of your brother and your sister. Stop it. 
Why not? Seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds. And if you haven't put off the old man and his deeds, you are still the servant of the devil. To whom you yield your members, servants to, he that committeth sin is of the devil. devil. (laughs) Seeing you put off the old man, what, and his and his thoughts of unbelief? No, no, his deeds, you see? You put on the new man which was renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond, free, Christ is all, in all. You only have one identity. There's only one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one name, one identity by which you are called. You are the children of God in the body of Jesus Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, and that's the end of it. Anything past that, you are beginning to transgress against the sanctification, the perfection of sanctification. And what an easy precept to understand in the intellect. It's simple. The only name you need is the name of Jesus. It's the only thing that you identify with as a Christian, period. Amen. You're not a Messianic Jew. No, now, if you're, true. now, the Bible does make distinction right. between the natural Jew and... Right. And, and the uh, Gentile. Because the overall plan of God through the course of history and time is such that God used the natural Jew as an uh, illustration of his secrets, of his mysteries. And he committed unto them the oracles, the words of God, and he had them kept. Then, then Christ came and took away the middle partition of wall between us, made no difference between the Jew and the Greek the Jew and the Gentile, and now we're all one in Christ, and it's all a spiritual thing, and there's no difference in identity. God does not recognize any difference in identity according to sex or uh, race or color or anything else. You are a member of the body of Christ. You are the church of Jesus Christ. That's all you are. If you say, I'm a Messianic Jew, then you are not of Christ. You are a Messianic Jew. You have a certain uh, identity and a distinctive identity and... uh, a declaration of identity that is somehow different, set apart from the body of Christ. So there's no Messianic Jews. And if you're a natural Jew and you see that the, uh, that the Gentiles uh, have Christ, uh, you, don't, you don't turn around and say, oh, well, they, they are the gospel goyim. There's no gospel goyims. There's no Messianic Jews. There are none. There's only individuals in the church of Jesus Christ. Are we going to stumble over the simplicity? But you see, we'll get to the next point of the sanctification of the church as a whole. Well, what does it say in John? The world knew him not, therefore the world knows us not. I always say this when I say this about the way I work at hotels and Everybody, all the Indian hotel owners know, oh, Jonathan the plumber, Jonathan the drywall guy, Jonathan will fix my ice machine, Jonathan. But they don't know me. Oh, yeah, yeah, we know, we know Jonathan. Yeah, we know him. He's the guy that does maintenance for our hotels. But they don't know me, right? right. They don't. No, because I'm Jonathan, the very elected teacher sent from God. That's who I am. But they don't know that. Right. They won't know it. They can't know it. Right. Unless God reveals it to them, Right. The world knew him not, therefore the world knows us not. So let's take the principle. The spirit of the world does not know or recognize or consider as a valid spiritual group of people the church of Jesus Christ or the image of Jesus Christ. Now, does the world recognize the Roman Catholic Church? Oh, yeah. Do they recognize the Lutheran Church? Do they recognize the Baptist Church? Do they recognize the Presbyterian, the Episcopalian, the AME, the... Pentecostals and so on and so forth. And then you have another avenue of so-called Christianity today where all the uh, individual ministers that name the ministries by their own names. You know, the such and such, brother, Ray, something or other ministries. We don't have to go through all the names. Sometimes I name them and sometimes I don't. All right. Then you have another aspect of this breach of sanctification on this very simple principle. You'll have a group of people that say, well, 
well, we're just, we just decided to start a group and we're not really ha- have a denominational affiliation, but we are, uh, we're New Hope Ministries. We're Extra Hope Ministries. We're Overcomer Ministries. <coughs> you understand? Yeah. Any kind of moniker or tag that you want to put on that, like that, it, it's the beginning, or at least the beginning, of the breach of this sanctification, of identification. Why can't we just identify as Christians and we're the body of Jesus Christ? Okay, so one of the reasons is, here we go, 501c3. And the 501c3 is a status given by the IRS to charitable organizations that makes them exempt from paying tax. And so to get a 501c3, you have to put an identification on your, on your uh, organization that the world knows. Right? Like from where we come, it was Faith Cathedral Fellowship or New Hope Ministries or New Life Ministries or, uh, you know, you see all kinds of things, Jesus Changes Lives Ministries and everything else. They want to come up with a catchy name. And I'm telling you, what, what, who, who came up with that stuff? The religious, religious imagination of men came up with that. Because every man that decides to put his own little tag on it makes another division. Now, some of these divisions have a more major effect, and some of them have a more minor effect, but we're talking about the principle. We're talking about the practice, and we're talking about the perfection of sanctification, beginning at its most simple application. How do you identify? What are you identified as by by being a servant of God? You are identified as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ. And amazing how people are going to stumble, do stumble. Now here's the thing. Um, I don't see where Jesus... Jesus, uh, this, this, this whole story of uh, uh, does your master pay tribute and then Jesus says, well, lest we should offend them, go catch the first fish and take a coin out and give them for, for them and me. And he says, of whom do the kings of the earth pay tribute or take tribute of the children or the strangers? And they said, well strangers. He says, well, then are the children free? Meaning that, that they are, the, the, the Christians are the true children of the kingdom, the true uh, inheritors of, of, of the earth, right? The meek shall inherit the earth. So they should be free. Technically, they should be free. But he says, for now, lest we should offend them, give them for me and for thee. Okay, I, did, I didn't see ever Jesus, and I didn't see Paul, and I don't see Peter, and I don't see any of the fathers of the church like that especially the New Testament church, go try to get a status of, of, of uh, identity that their government would recognize so that they could get a monetary benefit from the world. I, I, I don't see it. I don't see it at all. Especially when you have to deliberately identify yourself as something other than the church of Jesus Christ. And while we're at it, there's no sense trying to make any effort to get the institutions or the authorities or the structure of the world to try to recognize us as the church of Jesus Christ. The Bible already tells us the world's not going to know you. The world knows us not. The world knew him not. We don't need a deliberate, proactive effort to try to uh, um, compel the world to recognize who we are. Right? It's by manifestation of the truth. You know, love one another. Then, 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 uh, then the world will know. Sanctify them. Sanctify them. We're on to sanctification. Sanctify them. Give them one identity that, that the world may see and know that thou hast sent me. That's the real issue there. Okay. And I know I've heard things, and I haven't really followed through on this totally, but you have the king of Cyrus who decreed a decree to restore Israel, and Darius was in on all that, and that's, I think, in Ezra or Esther, I can't remember. Um, uh, oh, it wouldn't be Esther. It'd be Ezra, definitely Ezra. It would be in the book of Ezra. But you see, the thing there is that that was a decree from a king, a world ruler, because remember, Cyrus was not particularly, uh, he wasn't a Jew, he, wasn't, he was a heathen king. But God put it in his heart. He said, I, I've received from God to, to tell these Jews to restore the house of God. Well then, you know, if 501c3s fit into that kind of pattern, then the fi- benefit of the 50c3 would only be to people who call themselves the Church of Jesus Christ. 
you would have all these different identities incorporated into the application of a 501c3. I mean, you know, it's, it's like, where is this in the New Testament? Where is the uh, pattern in the New Testament that you can say, oh, well, the, you know, the apostles had government benefits to help their ministry. No, they didn't. <laughs> they didn't. The world did not know them. If you get a 501c3, a benefit from a government of this world, and a monetary one at that, because you are willing to call yourself something other than the Church of Jesus Christ, you're transgressing sanctification. (laughs) And the most fundamental, simple level there is. And that's why I've always stood on this, and I've heard different things, and I've meditated on, on this for a long time and I'm finally I wondered about this and wondered about that and folks if you don't believe me now you're going to believe this council let's take it out of the realm of me okay so I can't be accused of being iniquitous I'm sorry if you don't believe this council now we'll have to embrace it and believe it more and more as persecution arises as a one world government and everything takes its form and the beast takes its shape and begins to stamp out all resistance and all of that kind of thing. And that's why gather first the tares into the bundles. Okay? So I'm sitting and I'm listening and I'm listening to preachers calling people I know, people I know to be Christians, people that I have a witness, a a true witness, that they are Christians, and I'm listening to preachers call them tares, accusing them of being tares. And those very preachers are taking identities. They have 501c3s. They have identities. They call themselves such and such ministries. You call yourself anything ministries. I don't care what adjective you put in front of it. Doesn't matter. You're taking another uh, identity. And you're getting a worldly benefit by compromising your sanctification with God. Okay, so you're, you're, you're doing that. And why? For, for what? For money. For money. This identity thing is, is a real fundamental, very hinging thing. This is, this is wheat and tares. This is wheat and tares stuff. Oh, here it was. Here's the irony. The man who was accusing the brothers I know, who are Christians, of being tares, he himself has more of the markings of tear on him than the people that he's accusing. This is why I'm pointing this out. Does your ministry have a name other than Jesus Christ? Are you a such and such ministry? Are you a something cathedral, this and that? And you're getting the benefit. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless the Lord. Who forgiveth all thy iniquities, heals all thy diseases. Forget not all his benefits. Okay. And I'm telling you, a man of true sanctification and faith, God will provide him the means to fulfill his ministry without the help of the world. He don't need no arm of flesh. Mm-hmm. I'm now convinced he doesn't need a 501c3. Not only does he not need it, but he is beginning to transgress sanctification of the church. Mm-hmm. This is the will of God. Remember last week? This is the will of God, even your sanctification. Now I'm taking the general principle of sanctification. And I'm telling you a particular aspect of sanctification that many people are in error with, transgressing. It all has to do with the simplicity of what we identify ourselves as. Right? No Messianic Jews. No, uh, whatever. No, uh, none of that. No Torah groups. No this, no that. There is only one identity. There is only one. So, that's why it's come out of her, my people. Now, let me tell you a story now. (laughs) Now I remember, now I remember. Now, so you gather the tares first, then you gather the wheat. So what I'm saying is the restoration, the restitution, the restoration of all things, the perfection of the saints, the perfection of getting all God's people out of the religious corruption and pollution and organizations of men and getting them as a true entity, identity, the church of Christ, the body of Jesus Christ, that comes after, the fullness of that comes after the gathering of the tares. Well, pretty much the tares are gathered, right? So while the tares are being gathered, we do not have a full manifestation of the restoration of the church because that comes after. Now we're going there eventually. God, with patience, you go to perfection. And God has a lot of patience to bring His church to perfection. While we're on the way to perfection, 
For, oh, for instance, going back to Deuteronomy, don't take your Passover where you choose, but in the place where the Lord your God shall choose to put his name there. And if the place that the Lord the God has chosen to put his name, if it be too far from you, in other words, if the restoration of, of all things is in time is too far away from where you live, where, where you're living in the time frame you're living at, then there was a provision where you could turn it into money and you could do this and you could do that. But what I'm saying is that, okay, do you get the idea? We're headed to perfection. God's going to sanctify this thing. And you're going to have to follow this, this, this move of God's calling us out to further sanctification. We're going to have to follow this, pursue it, and embrace it. Because we are, we are at the end. But let me tell you a story. So I used to go to the UPC for a number of years, and they are basically a oneness church. Uh, there is a uh, dispute between Trinitarians and onenesses, and it all has to do with um, Jesus' name and what you say when you baptize, Jesus' name versus uh, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and all that stuff, and I'm not going to go into that. But, you know, we, uh, and I've watched the uh, standard of holiness and the it's the sort of walls of holiness of the UPC begin to come crumbling down. And I've watched them compromise and fall away from since the time I was in that church way back in the 80s, late 80s, so or mid-80s. But here's the thing. While I was in uh, Canada, in, in Pembroke, I had no fellowship, and I was seeking the Lord, and I didn't know where to go. Well, there was no man of God there that was sanctified as the body of Christ. There's no body of Christ. There's no perfection of sanctified group of people that only said they were the church of Christ. They're just a whole bunch of denominational churches. And so the Lord, through circumstance, led me to people by time and chance. I didn't plan it. I just met with people who invited me to church and I went to the church and I got filled with the Holy Ghost and I got delivered from cigarette smoking and the Lord told me, you go here. Even though it was a denominational church, God said, Go here. The Holy Ghost led me into the United Pentecostal Church. Right? Well, and then I stayed. Then I grew in stature. I grew in knowledge. I grew in understanding. And, uh, uh, this and that and the other thing. I met other Christians. I met an evangelist. That's Brother Glenn. I met him. Who was a man who God had called and told him to come out from among them. And he was just at the very beginning of his ministry as an evangelist. So finally I got to the point where God told me, okay, now you know this, you stand on this, you do this, you do that. You know, I knew, I knew at that time I no longer was willing to celebrate Christmas like the UPC does. I was no longer willing to, have, to be participating with their special Halloween services and New Year's Eve services and various other things. So, so finally what happened is God, God called me out. He said, okay. Come out of her. So is God a, a double-minded, uh, hypocritical God because first he told me to go in and then he told me to come out? No, God's not hypocritical or double-minded because the circumstance at the time, the best place for me to be for the circumstances that existed for me at the time was to go into the UPC. And that was God's will. And then once I attained a certain stature and God... Uh, move time and chance and circumstances for me to come into a fellowship with an, an actually sanctified evangelist who was actually called by the Lord Jesus Christ to be an evangelist of the church of Jesus Christ and nothing else, a man willing to take that sanctification. I identified with that. I agreed with it. He didn't make me, make me believe it. I just agreed with it. My spirit bore witness with it. Now it's time to come out of the place that I told you to go in previously. So what I'm saying is, it's absolutely, can be absolutely a righteous thing for God to say to a man, go to this particular fellowship of people, and then 15 years later say, come out of there. Yeah. They're apostatized. Mm -hmm. right. They've apostatized. You can no longer be partaker of their sin. Do not be a partaker of other man's sin. If man's struggling with a sin, but he's fighting the good fight, it's like I say, that's one thing. But if he's soliciting my talents and abilities to help him strive towards his sin, and he's using my abilities to further his willing, sec, uh, sinful agenda, I don't have to uh, comply with that. 
No. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. No fellowship with it. So yeah, God told me to go there, and God told me to come out. Now you hear what the charge is. Some people say, oh, well, you should never leave because Jesus says, I will never leave or forsake you. Well, that's Jesus Christ, the perfected high priest. The perfected high priest will never leave or forsake you as an individual in your walk with God. But can't you have enough common sense to know that God has not started, that the church does, uh, in, in our generation, in our lifetime, we, didn't, we weren't born into a church that existed in its perfection. Most of us were born into this period, this generation, where we, we, our Christian experience began, it began in the gathering of the tares. Before the perfection of the church's identity had had opportunity to manifest yet. So therefore, of course, God is going to say things like, go here, go there. And then after a period of time, when he, can, when he got the most out of that situation onto perfection that you can possibly get, and they begin to apostatize, okay, come out of her. So yes, God told me, go to the overcomer ministry. And yes, God told me, leave the overcomer ministry. You can't be a partaker of those evil deeds. You can't exploit grace. Have grace. Whereby you can serve God acceptably, holy, righteous, and mind, body, soul, and spirit with, with reverence and godly fear. Have grace. Don't exploit it. It's like the man I heard say once, said, oh, my wife, she's a rebel, blah, blah, and she's gone from me, and I'm such a man of God, and uh, uh, I have such integrity, and... God is in me that, that in spite of her being a rebel, I will still provide for her. You know, I'll still send her money so she can live. And he said, now, now I'm going to provide for her, but I'm not, uh, not going to finance her rebellion. You understand? Yeah. In other words, you can have somebody in rebellion, estranged from you, and the love of God will be in you enough that you'll still help them exist and live and sustain them. But you're not going to give them so much money that it enables them a free practice of their rebellion. You're not going to do that, right? Well, such is grace. <laughs> such is grace. Grace isn't there so that you have a free practice of your sin. You strive towards sin instead of away from sin, as I say. Yeah, grace will cover you, but grace will not finance your sex agenda. Or your lust or your worldly ambition. Amen. That's the misuse. That's the exploit of grace. That's what we've been talking about all along. So we're not tares. We are not tares. Alright? Um, the people, people that call us tares have more of a resemblance of a tear than we do. Of course, it's not over yet, is it? I still have hope, but it's harder and harder. I don't know, you know, I get put in this awkward position. I have to, I have to shore up the integrity of the saints against all these lying slanders. Right? And it's such a provocation. And don't think provocation just comes from the underlings, the people of God, you know, you know in the days of provocation when our fathers provoked God in the wilderness. Yeah, there is that provocation. But, you know, authorities and fathers are provokers too. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath or discourage or wrath or anger, lest they be discouraged. Well, if I keep hearing the constant provoking slander against the integrity of saints, I'm obligated to shore up and confirm the souls of these of these my brothers. And it's a tightrope walk because, well, what can I say? It's a provocation. Sometimes you say, should I just hold my peace, or what should I do here? You know, if it's if it's on a personal level, we'll find out. If I'm just if I'm just speaking out of my own personal sore, that's one thing. And I, I'm willing I'm willing to rise up and speak and put it to the test, and put myself put myself into the hands of God's grace and mercy. But my plea is that why should we provoke one another like that? Why should we slander? Why should we? Uh, you know, the accuser of the brethren is the devil. And if you want to accuse me or my brothers, 
On what basis? What's your scriptures? Don't just call us names and say, oh, you're just a tear. You tear things up. No. There's plenty of things being torn up in the church world. Yeah. Plenty of things. Plenty of lies being torn up by scandal and everything else. So, right? So, uh, so uh, what is this? You know, can someone come by and, and, and uh, break down? For instance, I'll put myself in it. Everything I've been expounding for the last year about the truth of, of pure holiness, righteousness, all of that, all the things we've been talking about, all the things we've been throwing out there as a righteous plea against the slander against us, because we know that if there's ever to be a restoration, there has to be an acknowledging of these yeah. truths that I'm speaking. Amen. You have to acknowledge these truths I'm speaking, or there is no restoration. So, uh, can someone come and break this down and, and, and refute what I'm saying with the Scripture, pre principle after principle? You know. So what I'm saying is, if I may dare to say so, is full of substance. It's full of pr principle and precept upon precept. It is sound doctrine that cannot be gainsaid or resisted except through some desperate slur or uh, insult. So come, dismantle what I'm saying, scripture by scripture, precept by precept. If I'm a terror, how am I a terror? How am I transgressing? How am I not the elect seed of God? Yeah. How am I not a member of the body of the church of Jesus Christ? Because I won't freely go along with your excessive transgression, your exploit of grace. Well, you don't have much of a case there. No case at all. And then, of course, again, I have to look at the Word of God. The wicked fall by their own counsel. Look at Psalm 50. You partake with a thief. Uh, you consent with a thief, partaker with an adulterer, you slander your own mother's son. The mother is the church. The mother's son is your brother. And you slander him. You slander him to protect your own evil works. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest... Oh yeah, thou thoughtest I was altogether such a one as yourself, uh, as myself. God says, you thought you were altogether such a one as me, huh? Right? You thought we were all likeness or similitude, just like unto me. For, consider this, you, you that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces and there be none to deliver. Really? You, you want to heap up, either you're heaping up wrath or you're heaping up a greater degree of scourge, one or the other, to continue in this kind of practice. And I would spare you. If I could, I would spare it. And I would plead for the integrity of those who have integrity, and the people that I gather with that have integrity. I plead for the recognition and acknowledgement of our integrity before God. That's, that's really the motivation here. Now, the last thing I'm going to say is in John. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. So the world does not know you. They do not recognize you as a religious, spiritual people. They don't know you. This is my point with the, with the government, the 501c3. The, the government knows all those groups. Oh, we know you. Oh, here's our benefit. Well, without our dogs, right? Without our dogs. So the government, even though the powers that be are ordained of God... The government is a governing body of authority and, uh, that God has put there to stem the propagation of evil in the world so that the world doesn't self-destruct so fast that the church can't get perfected. Right. So that's why the government's there. Yeah. But they are the government of what? They're the government of dogs. <laughs> the people that want to feed off the government, you're eating from a dog's dish. You ever consider that? Should the church eat off the dog's dish don't don't and don't come with me with a Syrophoenician woman even the even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table because these crumbs are not coming from the master's no, table no, it's not Jesus' table. table you follow me yeah. let's apply these things and put all the points all the principles together and get a clear description of what sanctification means so, yeah, we don't want Christians feeding off a dog dish. God doesn't want that. 
I've never seen the righteous forsaken or seed begging bread, begging for the world's benefits. So, yeah, i am finally come full, pretty much full circle that I do not agree with the 501c3. I didn't know for the longest time. I considered a lot of different aspects of it, you know. But I'd say certainly as we come to the end of the age, God's going to make this sanctification issue more and more mandatory, let's say, inevitable that you're going to have to do that. Okay, so the world knew him not. The world knows us not. Knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Every man hath that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth, transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And you know he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Now just remember, folks, we are being cleansed one area at a time. A certain section of our heart gets cleansed. Another section of our heart gets cleansed. Another section of our heart gets cleansed. Right? So there's areas that we are abiding in Him, and there's areas that we are not abiding in Him. Okay? Just... But if you are abiding in Him, you don't sin. It's like you're born of God. Christ has been formed in you. He's come forth. And now, He is growing in His maturity and stature. Hopefully, of course, some people are, have spiritually stunted growth. Right? And for those who are us, who are spiritually stunted in our growth, we can hope for that sudden growth spurt at the end of the age, maybe, huh? But still, we're looking for perfection, okay? Whosoever abideth him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. Don't let any man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous he that committeth sin is of the devil now you can commit sin and be of the devil and then in another avenue where your heart's been cleansed you do something that is right and you and you're not of the devil but you see we're in this we're like Jacob and Esau struggling in the womb we're back and forth Jacob and Esau the new man's trying to get hold of the flesh. The old man's trying to get hold of the flesh. You put that old man to death. Don't pursue him. Don't give him provision. Don't strive towards him. Don't embrace him. Don't delight in it. Don't go after it whole hog. You put him to death. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And when Jesus Christ is, comes forth out of your heart into your flesh, you are born again. You are putting on the wedding garment. His coming forth in His power, it purges out. It purges out the occupation of the old man. Okay? And it, He destroys the works that the devil was doing in you. And you don't do those works anymore. He destroys, and I'll add to it, and I'm not adding to his word, but I'm clarifying by adding to, the, adding to the statement. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil from being manifested in you. Amen. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. Because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest. And the children of the devil. Let's say the wheat and the tares. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. And if you don't love your... Well, let me read on first. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning. That we should love one another. Not as Cain who was of that wicked one and slew or slandered, or lied about his brother's integrity and intentions. Wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Brothers, I am for peace. I am for restoration. They are for war. They are for continuing 
in unrighteousness that they love. Sinneth, E-T-H, continuing, 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 continuing. And because the love of darkness is in them, therefore their only recourse is to malign and attack and slander those that are righteous. Wheat and tares. Right? People who bear the image of Christ have a mirror effect. When people in wickedness look at the righteousness of Christ in you, they see their own wickedness, but they impute you with it. Their own sword shall return. This is, this is what's at stake. So this is the message. You should love one another. Now what person that loves his brother accuses him and slanders him with no scriptural basis at all? The person who does that does not have the love of God in him or operating in him. Amen. Cain was of that wicked one, slew his brother. Wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. All right, <laughs> sanctification, wheat and tares. Tares have no fruit. These bring forth no fruit to perfection. The righteousness of God, the manifestation of truth in your mortal bodies. The sins that they practice from the beginning are continually and, and to this day and will be, are, are, going, are they're continually being committed again and again and again and again and again. There is no overcoming. That's it. That's... Uh, an issue of sanctification as applied to the name of the church, the wheat and the tares, defining the wheat and the tares. In there is my plea for my integrity in Christ, your integrity in Christ against those who slander us in the hope of, in the slim hope, <laughs> holding out that something will be acknowledged that gives a glimmer of hope for some kind of acknowledging of the truth, which is the prerequisite and the imperative thing that needs to be there to begin restoration. Now, if there's no restoration, I don't know. Some people think there's no restoration in certain situations. i got to say, honestly, I haven't got there yet, but I'm not there yet. Even though I, I speak with all this boldness, running the risk, risk of looking like I'm some kind of uh, brawler and striker or whatever, I trust I have enough scriptural substance in what I say that most people know the difference. Right. Okay. I'll just leave it at that. All right? God bless you.